So finally, after so much talk, COP26 at Glasgow is finally about to happen, starts on Sunday. And with a very significant University of Reading involvement, we're going to be there physically and we're going to be there virtually. Uh, notably, the Walker Institute has a, quite a formal involvement as well. So um, what's what we put together here are four staff talks um, before today, during uh, COP26 and after COP26 on how we think about and how we work on climate change at the university and its impacts, about how our research contributes to climate policy and to climate action, and how our University of Reading institutional policies and actions contribute locally and more broadly. There's a lot more details about all these staff talks on the on the staff portal. So as Dean for Environmental Research, I'm really delighted to kick off this series. So today we've got two talks for you, one from Nigel Arnell in Meteorology and addressing the very simple question of what is COP26? And then we've got um, a, a group presentation uh, led by Andrew Charlton Perez on the Climate Education Summit that we held in the run up to the COP. What we're going to do is we're going to hear both talks one after the other and then we're going to have all the questions at the end and I'm quite sure that Nigel, Andrew and team will be very happy to take any questions after the event and in the in the in the coming weeks as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Nigel for the first talk. Nigel is a professor of climate science here at the university, has been a long time contributor to the various um, uh, international reports on climate change and has recently uh, spent time on secondment to the Cabinet Office in Government to work on UK risk and resilience planning. So over to you, Nigel. Thank you, Bill. Right, well, hopefully everybody can see that screen. Um, I'd like to really talk about what COP26 is, um, and I want to cover in these next 15 minutes just five things. Uh, what is COP26? Why is it important? How does COP work? Um, how does the science, the evidence that the researchers are producing fit into the process and and what are going to be the challenges I think to a, a successful outcome from COP. So what is COP? Uh, it dates back to 1992 with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change which was first developed in Rio in 1992 so that's nearly 30 years ago where countries agreed together to to try and reduce climate change uh, and specifically they wanted to prevent dangerous climate change. Now, it's a very clever piece of drafting because nobody really wants to be for you know, pro dangerous climate change. But the, the the document, the convention doesn't define what dangerous climate change is. So over the years, um, the, the, the countries that have signed up to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change have met to work out how to implement this framework. Uh, and those meetings are known as the conferences of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And you can see why they're, they're called COP. Um, so COP26 is the 26th meeting of the Conference of the Parties. They've been almost annual, um, apart from the first couple of years and of course, apart from, from last year. So a, an important COP was COP3 back in the late 1990s, which set up the Kyoto Protocol, which was the first attempt to come up with some international agreement on how to reduce emissions. The next really important one was COP21 in 2015 in Paris, and this produced the, the famous Paris Agreement, which, like all international legal texts, has got lots and lots of words in it which mean very specific things. But essentially, there are, there, there are two key components to that. One is that the countries that have agreed or ratified the Paris Agreement from COP21 uh, have agreed to try and collectively limit the increase in temperature to about 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. That's the middle of the 19th century. And also to aim for net zero emissions by the middle of the century. So this is where the idea of a 1.5 degree target has come from as a definition of dangerous and where this idea of net zero comes from. The way the Paris Agreement works is that countries, rather than being told what to do by from the top down by the United Nations, they it, each country makes pledges. Um, each country makes its own commitment to what it's going to do to reduce emissions. The Paris Agreement 
also includes information and agreements and promises and commitments on on funding and on adapting to the increasing risks that we're going to see. Now, they're not the headline, but as we'll I mentioned in a few minutes, they're often the things that are the major sticking points in uh, making subsequent agreements. So what's COP26? Uh, essentially, it's five years after the Paris Agreement. Um, it's actually six, but it was planned to be five. And it was the opportunity for countries to review their pledges to see where we're headed and essentially to increase those pledges, um, known in the, in the jargon as raising the ambition. At the moment, um, the pledges that countries have made collectively would get us to about three degrees, a little bit below. Um, th this is a little bit out of date now because countries have been submitting pledges over the last few days. Um, Australia recently submitted a pledge. But with the current pledges that are on the table, we're looking at an increase of about three degrees, which is quite a lot above the 1.5 target or even the, the, the two degree target, which is also mentioned in the, the Paris Agreement. And if we had a, a world which reached three degrees above pre-industrial levels by the end of the century, then we would be seeing some quite dramatic impacts. And what this graph here shows is on the left is the increase in temperature. And on the right, it's three measures of impact to do with heat waves and floods and, and droughts and so on. The basic measure method or conclusion is that with the high increases in temperature that we're, we would see with the current pledges, we would get really quite big increases in impact. And we would still get increases in risks, even if we did manage to hit some of these really quite stringent targets. So basically, the current pledges aren't enough. Um, and the aim of COP26 is to get countries to make bigger commitments to reduce emissions still further. So how does COP work? Um, the central bit, the core of COP, um, is the bit that's actually organised by the United Nations. And that's where the various negotiations and things happen. So that's when essentially people are sitting in dark, not smoke filled, but um, dark rooms, thrashing out sentences and text. This is the culmination of a long process of just taking several years. Um, the COP unit within the cabinet office was set up a couple of years ago, but the UK's climate diplomacy has been going on for, well, for decades. So it, this is not something that everybody suddenly turns up in Glasgow and sits down and works out what to talk about. There's a long history and um, background to this. So in the centre, the UN organised part, in Glasgow it's called the Blue Zone, there are a series of negotiations, um, breakouts and so on, and at the end of the day an agreement will be reached, hopefully. Also in this central core are a series of what are called side events, where organisations will try and present results of what they've been doing most recently to the negotiators. It's to inform and influence the negotiators, but to a large extent a lot of the you do, negotiators aren't looking for new information now. They've had it for, for several years and it's, it's a long process to influence the negotiators. So that's the central bit in the Glasgow. It's called the blue zone. Around the edge, there's a bit which is organised by the host country, in this case, the UK. Uh, and in Glasgow, it's known as the green zone, where there are lots of what we can think of as fringe events. And that's where, for example, the research councils have um, have a series of meetings sort of showcasing the research that's being done in the UK research environment um, and where lots of organisations will have uh, meetings and events, some of them live, some of them online. The aim is for the, well, a lot of these organisations think that the aim is to influence what's going on in the blue zone. Um, in practice, that, that that doesn't happen very much, often because the two zones are geographically separated. Um, so you don't get people from the blue zone wandering past um, often some of the side events that they're, they're in different buildings. But the main aim is really to talk amongst organisations and to use the opportunity of COP as an outreach, um, is to use it as a, as a hook to hang lots of climate change messages, um, information off of the event. And COP, outside of it, there are lots of what we can think of as some very fringe activities or spin-off meetings. And uh, these are actually increasingly important. And these are meetings that are set up by, um, for example, business organisations or major philanthropic funders who, again, use COP as an opportunity to get together, to have a chat um, and come up with some agreements. And I'm actually going to give some presentations to a group of uh, major climate philanthropic funders who are trying to work out what their long term strategy 
should be. So this COP is this, there's a centre bit of COP, and then there's lots of other things that spin off it, um, which have influence both on the, the the broader public discourse about climate change and also on what organisations, state and non-state, actually do. So that's how COP works. Um, where does the I've called it here, where does the science fit in? But I'm talking about the evidence produced by university researchers, for example. Um, one of the main sources is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And here we see um, the six Reading authors for the first working group. Um, the first working group report was produced, uh, published earlier this summer. And that's really the, what, what they call the science of climate change. It's about how the climate system is, is changing and evolving and so on, and how it might change in the future. That's the group that's reported so far. The other groups haven't reported yet, and they're due to report next year, and they're on impacts and they're on how we reduce emissions. Um, so they're, they're really important, but they haven't produced their final reports yet. So the IPCC influences the negotiations over time. Um, academic papers, by which I mean stuff that we produce as university scholars, um, are surprisingly unimportant, to be honest, because um, very few negotiators or people coming up with climate agreements, they not many look at academic papers. They look through IPCC reports or they look through reports and briefings by organisations, um, by what they perceive to be reputable organisations. And here I've shown a picture of a the, the front cover of a report produced by Chatham House, which is the uh, so the independent organisation in the UK that looks at foreign affairs. So these are really important. And if we're really trying to influence what goes on over time in the various COP processes, then actually we need to think a lot more about how we present the science, the, the work that we're doing. Um, and these reports and briefings from reputable organisations, uh, hopefully the university will be regarded as a reputable organisation are really important and I think we're probably under exploiting that. Um, and the other thing I just want to highlight here um, is that there's a lot of research, a lot of research tends to be rather um, quantitative if you like, um, but a lot of organisations and a lot of lobby groups or agencies are interested in the really big consequences of climate change, the impacts on food security or displacement or migration or collapse of civilization, and going from the, the science at one end to these big consequences at the other is really complicated. Um, and it, it's, I mean, in many senses, it's not actually a quantitative science problem. We need to think really creatively about how we can come up with plausible, robust narratives describing what the really big consequences of climate change could plausibly be. Otherwise, um, the, the ground is taken up by extremists who have one particular view on what could happen about how it could be OK or it could be absolutely catastrophic and so on. And I think this is a big gap um, about translating some of the quantitative work that a lot of organisations do into the things that people are concerned about um, and having some robust evidence to underpin that. And we've got a scope there at Reading to, I think, to do that. Finally, where are the challenges? Um, at the highest level, that the science argument has been won. There won't be any arguments at COP about is climate change happening. Um, that's been that's been won. Um, there are some really important science about how we use the information and how we construct information to make real, positive, actionable decisions. Um, and that's a non-trivial problem. That's a really, really challenging thing to do. But the big question about is climate change happening? That's been resolved. The arguments about how we use robust information to make sensible decisions. But I think when it comes to COP, um, the big challenge is going to be how we make the transitions that are going to be necessary in order to increase our pledges or hit one and a half degrees, how to make them equitably. And in a sense, that's, that's, there isn't a right answer to that. Um, that's where choices come in and that's where the politicians become really important. We've seen over the last few weeks the problems that might arise um, with energy prices increasing or petrol prices going up. Dealing with climate change essentially is dealing with those sorts of transition risks. It's not what we need to do, it's how we get from here to there that is the real, real sticking point. And that's where policies and choices um, become really important. Um, 
just flag a couple of stumbling blocks at the, at the end. Um, I mentioned that COPs are primarily about increasing, <laughs> increasing efforts to reduce emissions, um, but there are also these other bits. There's the adaptation bit, there's the finance bit, um, and these in practice are going to be some of the real stumbling blocks to whether we make any progress. Um, again, we've seen in the press recently comments about the, uh, the, the funding that's been committed so far hasn't been provided, hasn't been, um, countries are asking for, 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 for countries that have already made pledges to fulfil those pledges. Some countries are asking for greater financial contributions and so on. And these are probably going to be the stumbling blocks that we'll see when we come to the last few days of, of COP, which is in about two and a half weeks or, or, or so. So that's what COP is, um, where the science and the evidence that we've been developing at Reading and of course at other places, where it fits in and where I think some of the big challenges are going to be and things to watch over the next couple of weeks. Now back to Phil. Thanks very much, Nigel. That's uh, fantastic. Um, I mean, Nigel made the very clear point at the end there that the science argument has been won. I think, you know, I think everybody here should understand and appreciate how crucial the research done at the University of Reading over the last 30 years has been to winning that science argument. Nigel showed a photo at the end of the of six Reading um, researchers who were lead authors in the most recent intergovernmental um, panel on climate change report. Um, I believe it's something like no other institution in the UK had so many lead authors and very few internationally had that number of lead authors. And every single one of those six intergovernmental panel reports on the state of the science with respect to climate change has had a huge contribution from Reading. So that's something that as an institution, I think we should be very proud of and, um, and, and not, not forget. As Nigel says, um, you know, the, the science argument has been won and um, uh, where we really are now in terms of research at least is a need to identify workable solutions to, um, to, to, to the impacts of, of the changes we can expect. And very often that requires many different disciplines to work together. And um, uh, you know, that's really what we're trying to do at the university at the moment is try and make it easier for people from different areas to work together to not only find solutions that could work, but solutions that can be adopted and are adopted so that they have a chance of chance of working. But of course, this this annual COP also gives us an opportunity to um, to uh, because it's in the public eye and public profile to um, do other things in terms of public engagement with respect to um, climate change and, and, and education and so forth, which brings us to our second talk, which is about um, because we had the COP coming up in Glasgow this year, um, Andrew and many others across the university um, uh, created a climate education summit, which was run in September. So I'm going to hand over now to Andrew Charlton Perez to kick off this presentation. Andrew is an atmospheric scientist with a long standing interest in public engagement in weather and climate. And um, here he's presenting with a cross university team who worked um, in September on this event. So, Andrew, over to you. Thanks very much, Phil. So um, the, both your introduction there and, and Nigel's uh, introduction about COP <clears throat> is, is a really great lead in to, to what we've done with our Climate Education Summit, which we call Climate in the Classroom. Um, but before we go into the detail of that, I just want to play a short video, which should hopefully give you an idea of, of, of the motivation that we took in, in setting up this initiative. What would happen if nobody did anything to save the planet? Climate change is the biggest crisis facing the world today. It's really important that we learn the facts about climate change at school so that we can know the truth. I'd like to know the impact of climate change on animals and the environment around the world. I would like to learn about how people's life is going to be like in a changed climate. I know that electric cars are better for the environment as they have less emissions than diesel or petrol vehicles. What I want to know is that how will we dispose of those worn out batteries, say five years hence? I hope we don't create a new monster. How will you help schools to make learning about climate change fun and so that we will remember it? 
I know climate change is important and my generation needs to know more about it. I think that we should be taught about endangered species and how climate change is affecting them. Some children don't know about global warming. Making more vegetables at home will, will stop um, pollution and help animals. All young people should be told about the damage we are doing to our world. If we don't know, we can't help. I think that we should go on more school trips and do more activities to help climate change change. If all school children could spend one month each year learning about climate change, then we could learn to protect the world. If we don't do something about it now, it could be too late. That's why it's really important that we learn about it in our schools. So clearly those, those brilliant young people are just fantastic advocates for why we need to improve climate education uh, for all school children in the UK. And as both Nigel and Paul made the point, um, all of the things that have been happening around climate in 2021, including COP, but also the launch of the IPCC report, have meant there's just been an unprecedented amount of attention focused on climate as an issue. And so we thought it would be a really great opportunity to think about this issue and think about how we can improve climate education for, for people between 8 and 18 across schools and colleges in the UK. Now we started on this journey by really trying to explore what was what was going on um, across the UK and we and we soon found out um, and we had connections to those organisations already in some cases that there are many, many brilliant organisations trying to improve climate education. Many of them are producing fantastic resources for teachers, but we also can see that that this is a huge lottery. Climate is not in the curriculum very much uh, across across the four devolved nations. And so if you happen to be uh, in a school with somebody who's a really strong advocate for this and has lots of knowledge, you get a fantastic climate education as a young person, but it's a real lottery and sometimes you don't. And so what we could see is that change is needed now. It's needed for those young people that you just saw in the video and it's needed at scale. Um, it can't happen with kind of small pilot projects and, and great work in individual schools. It needs to happen across the country and it needs those organisations working together. So. Our idea really was that a summit was a brilliant way to bring those organisations together, develop a team and really try to address this issue. And I'm going to pass on to Nazarene. So why is climate education needed? As we all know, young, pe young people like Greta Thunberg of Sweden and uh, Lesson Matunge of Kenya are driving the change on building a more sustainable future. They have enacted these changes through powerful tools such as Fridays for Future and the mock COP that took place in November 2020. This bold event was organised by young climate activists from around the world. So the young generation are clear on continuing the pressure on their governments to get to net zero. However, sadly, young people um, are dealing with a concept, a new concept that's developed called eco-anxiety. This is a broad term used to describe how young people cannot make sense of what is happening to the climate at a local, national and international level. And unfortunately, this feeling of helplessness is exacerbating mental health issues in young people today. So as educators, we must find sustainable ways to support teachers in understanding the subject and pedagogical knowledge linked to climate change and this was one of the key reasons why we wanted to explore these ideas um, during the summit and also in um, the mock cop that happened last year one of the clear themes was climate education and the way to implement it evidence already shows that over 70 percent of teachers feel that they do not receive adequate training to enable them to effectively deliver high quality climate education Therefore, we must support teachers in developing their subject and pedagogical knowledge in order for them to teach climate education um, in a meaningful and sustained way across the school age range. 
So what happened at the summit? More than 1,000 people registered for the summit and on the day more than 600 including many schools attended. So that means actually our outreach was much bigger than the 600 because they the children would have been watching as a class. There were two open keynote talks uh, from Josh Trigal and Baroness Brown. So Josh Trigal is on the top right in the picture. Uh, he was one of the campaign organisers for Mock uh, COP26 and that was a youth led initiative uh, in terms of uh, putting forward ideas to the Mock COP. Baroness Brown, she's chair of many organisations, so chair of STEM learning. She's uh, chair of a subcommittee for climate change for the government. Um, there were also talks from Serena Bashel, uh, climate activist, and Craig Bennett, CEO of the Wildlife Trust and also ex-alumnus of Reading. And these talks were chaired by the two people at the bottom there that you might recognise from ITV. So we've got Tom Clark, news editor, uh, science news editor, and Laura Tobin, ITV uh, weather presenter, and they did a great job sharing them. Now, after these uh, open sessions, we had some closed roundtable sessions that I was privileged to be part of, and over 20 different organisations took part. So we had children from schools uh, talking, and they were fantastic. We had uh, head teachers, uh, higher education organisations, charities, and we had a representative from the D, uh, DfE, their Department for Education. And the purpose of these sessions to really was to really look at our draft action plan, discuss it, and think about how we can move it forwards and who would be committing uh, different parts to that in order to drive this forwards. Um, I'm now going to hand over to the next person. As noted here, we have come up with a nine point action plan. Dan mentioned that that formed part of the discussion during the roundtable um, discussions in the event. Um, the plan in its first instance had been informed by many conversations that we'd had over the, the, the previous months, almost a year prior, and also from public staff, students, colleagues who we had invited to really send their ideas and input into what it was that they felt was needed and wanted from, from climate education. So after the discussions at the summit, the, the action plan was revised, um, although I have to say the nine points substantially remained the same. The plan we are going to launch uh, on Monday the 8th of November. So we have a virtual exhibit in the blue zone at COP that focuses on our work in climate education. Um, and we will also be adding the plan to our website, promoting it via numerous channels, including social media and uh, exploring press opportunities to ensure that we can really ensure that uh, we communicate back to people that we engage with initially and, and further beyond. So the nine points, um, which I can't go into detail here, but they include areas such as uh, initial teacher training. So that's in part to address um, elements that uh, Nazreen mentioned around teacher confidence and, and really knowledge and understanding of what the issues are. CPD for school staff and leaders. So that includes governors and, and staff who aren't maybe in teaching roles, but are still connecting with young people and quality assurance of teaching resources. So Andrew mentioned there are lots of teaching resources available, but they're mixed in quality and teachers don't necessarily know what's reliable. So now we need to work on keeping, uh, keep working with our partners, those that we uh, had engaged with prior and that we've developed uh, connections with along the way. And we're hoping that we can invite others to connect with us now and say, yes, they want to be a part of, of really taking action. And our aim really is to ensure that action starts to happen quickly. Fee. Thanks so much, Dawn and others. Um, so our journey started about a year ago today when we uh, discussed with Andrew and other colleagues on the that you've heard from today that the issue of climate education was something that we wanted to seize and, and, and do something about. Um, and what was really clear from the outset was that our role was a really important one around facilitation. We didn't ever pretend to be the experts in climate education, um, but we brought to the table um, a, a real expertise and a, and a known expertise in climate science, as we've heard, heard about already, and in education. And then what that's enabled us to do is um, exercise a, a power to, to uh, collaborate, to, to build partnership and to bring people together. And what's been really exciting for us, I think, is to recognise the role that we have in doing that isn't necessarily something that all other organisations that we've been working with, particularly government, 
has the ability to do. We have no ties, no political affili affiliation. In fact, we've been very clear throughout our, our, our journey over the last year that we don't have a political agenda here. Our role is to bring people together, to work together, to try and bring about change. Um, we're not trying to lobby. Um, yes, it's a campaign, but what we're trying to do is bring people together to, real, to really get the right voices heard, including those of young people, to bring about action. And we're really proud, therefore, that we're taking the action plan to COP to the blue zone um, in a week or so's time. So, as I've already mentioned, our standing within climate and environmental science um, and that of education has been a really important, a really important aspect to this. Um, and having the ability to be able to work with our colleagues across the university, not just from meteorology or from the IOE, but colleagues from, from many other departments and professional services was a really important part of this experience for us. This wasn't about um, just uh, raising the profile of the work that we were doing, but really trying to bring about some meaningful action and some meaning, meaningful change. Um, I really wanted to close our presentation by saying a big thank you to everybody that's been involved in this work. We are, as I've already mentioned, exceptionally proud of where we've reached, that we are taking this action plan with a huge following. Since the, since the summit took place on the 15th of September, we have had many, many, many follow up conversations with people that we hadn't already been in contact with, where doors have been opened, further action has been pledged by many other many other people and, and organisations, and including an increasingly close working relationship with the Department for Education, uh, which we feel very, very positive about how we can build more on as we go forward. Um, also really proud of our alumni contribution, as, as Dan mentioned, Craig, Tom and Laura, who played a really important part on the day of the summit um, and that work and their involvement continues. So a big thanks to everybody that's been involved. We really are only at the beginning. We're launching an action plan. We've got a, a significant role to continue to play in this and, and would love to hear from other colleagues uh, who are interested in this subject about the role you might be able to play or, or any further advice and guidance that you might have to us as we take this take this out into the world.